What's going on, everybody? Hope you are having a wonderful week so far. Uh, before we start, I have a Discord, um, which is kind of where I put everything on. Um, we talk about everything, music, podcast, merch, just general chat, food. Um, the link is in the description. Go check it out. Secondly, if you do listen to this podcast and you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. It means that the podcast can keep going and I can keep bringing bigger guests and newer guests. And it just allows the podcast to grow, which is always a good thing for me. Um, that's the only thing I will ever ask you to do on this podcast. So please, please do that if you can. Uh, this week on the podcast, AC Slater, owner of Nightbase Records. I've known AC for a long time and... Never really been able to like have a full on like heart to heart conversation with him. We're always on holy ships or we're always at festivals or just like doing the usual DJ stuff um, that we don't ever really get to get to hang out and spend real time with. So I wanted to get him on. He's also about to celebrate 10 years of Night Brace Records, which I love um, what he's done in the community for that scene of like UK house music in America. It's special. Um, so without further ado, AC Slater. What's cooking, man? Man, you know, just chilling, talking to Will Clark. It's been a long you know? time. I have not spoke to you for fucking ages. I don't even know when the last time was. I remember. When? I was thinking about it on the way here to my studio. Um, we were at some festival and I believe it was Canada. I could be wrong. I might have seen you like briefly, but we hung out at some festival that was like, there was like a house stage. Yeah. And there was like a dubstep, like a, you know, like a dubstep and like bass stage. And we were playing the house stage and we hung out and we were like walking around together and we went to the main stage. And I was like, you want to hear something different? And you're like, yeah. And then we went to go see Kill the Noise. <laughs> and we hung out on the stage and you were like, okay. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're like, cool, cool. And then you're like, I'm going to go like walk around. And um, yeah, but that was the last time I saw you. I think it was pre, pre-COVID. That was, that's got to have been like 2019. Yeah, I think so. Something like that. Easy. Yeah. Or even 20. Jesus, man. How's life? It's really good, man. Um, a lot has changed since then. It has. Um, you got you got a baby. I've got two babies. <laughs> two babies. When did the yeah. second one come? Uh, February. Congrats, so I've got. Man. It was hard. We had like two kids under two for yeah. like a while, and um, that's a lot. Yeah. So I got like a two and a half year old and and an eight month old. Amazing. Um, at home. Yeah. You love it. Cool. Yeah, it's great. Um, it's really hard when they're like. Inf like newborns and infants but now that uh my second is uh, a little bit you know older it's like yeah. manageable you yeah. know so how's um it's great to, uh, how's dad life changed your aspect on your life as well as your career but just generally i know it changes <laughs> a lot for people so I'd, I'd be really interested in that yeah it's uh it's really different um, we had our first, uh, during like lockdown, like towards the end of like lockdown, like, mm. you know, and then things started opening up after she was born and then we were like, all right, how's this going to work? You know? Yeah. Um, and I just kind of had to figure out the touring thing and, and, uh, with my wife and we got into like a pretty good groove quickly yeah. with it. Um, Cause it wasn't as easy as just like, Oh yeah, I'm going to go do a bunch of shows in a row and, and like not be home. Yeah. Um, cause I want to be home to help and I want to be home to like, you know, see everything. Cause it's so much happens when they're really young, like really quickly. So, um, yeah, we kind of got into a groove and then, um, yeah, it's all like, it's just like a never ending adjustment as, as they grow yeah. and change and the responsibilities change with you the parents as well so it's kind of like how does my career fit into this and how does this fit into my career yeah. and um i i think i have like you know right now i feel like i've cracked a code because like me and susie my wife have like really tried to balance everything and and there's different stages 
where it's mm-hmm. like this works, but then after a couple months it stops working and you yeah. have to adjust. So um I think my biggest thing I've learned recently is, you know, I was for a while I was trying to sort of juggle everything at the same time. Yeah. Where I'd be like watching the kids, but like trying to do emails and work at the same time. And I realized I have to kind of be a hundred percent present for work and a hundred percent present for family and kids like or you're kind of halfway there the whole time you know yeah. versus it's it's more productive to be there with the kids full on and not even think about work yeah and it's more productive to be at work and not think about all that so yeah it's 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 definitely a balance how, <laughs> yeah it sounds like how do you split your time then if it if you decide kids work like is there a specific do you do it specific days specific times of the days uh right now so all right i did a tour in uh when was that whenever the first january after everything reopened 2020 i did a tour with chami yeah it was my label night base and his label confession and we did a, a huge tour together we did a compilation album and all this stuff and i got to know martin horger on that tour yeah and he has two kids as well and I had just the one at the time. And um, at the end of the tour, he was like, so what do you do now? You're going to go home and make music and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to try. And he was like, what do you mean try? And I was like, oh, there's just like, it's so hard to like juggle and there's always something to do. And he was like, oh, he's like, I just wake up at like super early in the morning and that's my time to like work and no one you know, bothers me and distracts me. And I was like, what time do you wake up? And he was like 5 a.m. And yeah. I was like, all right, let me try it. And since then, I've been waking up at 5 a.m. because it's like this time of day where, you know, the kids are sleeping, everyone's sleeping, no one's texting you and bugging you about whatever work stuff. Um, So it's kind of like, that's one thing that really helps me. And that's like how I start my day. So 5 a.m. to like seven or so is like my time. Yeah. And then the kids wake up. I do that. The oldest goes to preschool and then uh yeah after that i just kind of like get my stuff together go to the studio and then i'm just working all day you know or whatever i have to do that yeah, day yeah. um and then you know evening time i'll come home and just hang out with the fam and it's like it's just a nice flow right now um day that's like the daily thing you know no um, I, I i totally get it you're also not the first person for me like on like that i know that has kids that does the early morning thing and it must be a thing that works because i guess we're used to not sleeping that much anyway generally right so it's like (laughs) you 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 can just get on with it and if it works it's fucking amazing like if you the more hours you can be up the more and be productive is you can get more shit done yeah and i'm a i'm a morning person so like i feel the most creative like earlier on Mm -hmm. you know so Sometimes I'll just get up and like put headphones on on my laptop and work for like two hours on music or um, or I'll go for a run or whatever. You know, it's kind of like my time to do whatever, but it's usually something productive. And um, yeah. And then like touring, it's like I try to do at the most like every other weekend. OK, um, it doesn't nice. always work out that yeah. way. But um, yeah, I think my career has gotten like good enough to where I don't have to like sort of do everything yeah. like I'm a bit like more picky and choosy because just because of the kids mostly and um how does that feel yeah, I'm fortunate enough to do that so how does that feel to get you because obviously I've known you for a very long time but how does it feel to like finally be at that point in your career where you can pick and choose have you even thought about it no it, it's like I have this like I'm sure most artists have this, but I have this sort of never ending fear that like, it's all going (laughs) to go away. So like (laughs) everything I do, I'm like, is this the right thing to do? But um, it feels good to, you know, once I realized that, cause you know, I don't come from like a lot of like money or anything like that. And I've never had like a a ton of like, it's, you know, I don't know. I've always had this drive. Like I needed to work, you know what I mean? Like I needed to make money to survive. And, um, when I kind of quit my day job back in the day, it was like really scary. So I've always kind of like 
taking everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. That was always my philosophy is like a gig. Yeah, I'll take it. Yeah, and then yeah. when people started being like, you know, you don't have to like do all these things. Like when I started saying no to things, it was like, then people kind of wanted it more. And I was like, oh, this is cool. Like, you know what I mean? And I'm like lucky enough that like there was a demand um, and it, you know, hopefully it continues, but yeah, yeah. It just got better. Cause then you can like, kind of like curate what you do versus just playing some like kind of dodgy show just to do it because you're like, I got to work. I got to work. Um, yeah. And I think also it's like when it gets to that point, I'm still at that stage where like we've just started to say no to things mm -hmm. and not everything. But like, there's still like, so like there, there's still situations where I'd like to say no, right? Um, but I just have, I'm still at that stage where I'm like in my head where I'm like, I feel like I still have to do everything. Um, or like, if I'm not working on a weekend, I struggle with the whole like, well, you're being lazy, you've you're not gigging this weekend. But you're a hundred percent right. The minute you say no, the the more offers come in or the the hype comes in and it's so strange why do you think that is i don't know i mean it i guess it's one of those things where it's like it's not like a guarantee that if you say no like suddenly everything's gonna be like we we really want to totally. book you but it's yeah, like yeah. it's got to be like the right like all the right like settings right so yeah. everything's got to be kind of in the right place and then you do that and it's like I guess it's like you want what you can't have kind of thing. Always, I don't know. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, I don't know. And it's like, you know what you want to play your dream gigs and, and you kind of know what you want your tour diary to look like. And I guess the goal is to like achieve that. And at some point you have to start working at it and it's a little scary, but you know, just gotta keep going. That's cool that you're about to kind of start doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, it was kind of like a thing this year that we decided to like say no to more things, um, just for like, just so I can write more music, really, um, mm -hmm. and kind of like have a periods of time where like I have longer periods to write music and concentrate on that and spend time with family and stuff like that. It's definitely. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a process for me. It's like, I struggle with it. If I could tour five days a week, I would tour five days a week and mm. and try and deal with it all of, all the rest of life on top of that. But um, in your situation with kids, wife, that would be pretty fucking hard. Yeah. And it, it's even before that, it was like, we never have enough time, right? It's like, mm, especially when you're yeah. traveling a lot, there's a lot of dead time that you can't do much with. And, um, you know, it's, I also have a label and we do events and all this stuff. And like, so there's always calls yeah. and emails and meetings. And, and you're like, when do I make the music again? <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's tough, you know, and, and it reflects sometimes when you're like, you look at your, what, what I do this year? And it's like, you know, you didn't put out a ton of music because you were doing other stuff. Yeah. And, and for me, at least like there's a mindset that I have to get in to be able to be creative. Like yeah. I can't just do a bunch of like office type work and then be like, all right, I'm going to go like work for two hours and make a banger. It's 100%, like, <laughs> it takes me a day or two to kind of like yeah, my creative brain to come back to life and you know what I mean? Get into like a groove. And so it's tough. It's, it's, there's certain people that can do that. You got your Skrillexes and stuff who could make like a killer track, like just on that. a flight yeah. or in the bathroom or whatever, you know, it's like, <laughs> I don't know. So it happens sometimes, but yeah, it's, it's that, that time balance again. It, it always shows up when you're, I, I think it's also it. like priorities, right. As well. It like from like, obviously like you have an extremely successful record label that runs a lot of parties as well. And you, it's not, you're not just a DJ producer, right? You have a lot of other things in the music industry that you have to deal with. And I think that just adds more to it. You, you like with, even with night Base, like you release records, you run events, you do merch, like just that a lot alone is a full-time job. And that's mm -hmm. not taken out of 
your DJ, your like own career, your like DJ career and your production career. And then also being a husband and a dad, like everything takes a lot of time. And I think it is, I can't relate to the husband and the dad side of things, but there does come a point. It's like it, it where the priorities kind of, for me sometimes can be like skewed and be like, wait, what gave me all of this? What got me to this point? And that was writing music and that all got me to the point. But for me, sometimes the writing music can be the last priority of all of it. Mm -hmm. the, and, and writing the music is what got you all of those other distractions. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's the, there's like times like earlier this year when it was just like probably one of the hardest times of my life. Like, as far as just responsibilities and, and lack of time and, and resources was, you know, when our second was about to be born and we had just moved and like, there was a lot going on. We lost like our childcare mm. and we don't have family here in LA. So um, it's really hard, like, you know, on your own. And I was just like, I had an album deadline that was like coming up and I was just, that was like self-imposed and, and everyone's like, all right, we need to announce it. And I had nothing. And it was just like, I had no studio and like yeah. all this stuff. And I felt so like just buried. And it was like, oh my God, I'm sitting here like watching a baby. You know what I mean? Like yeah. while the light, like and sometimes because all you think is like, I got to make music. Like I got to like be active and do all this stuff to like continue feeding my family yeah, and all this. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just sitting there playing with a kid and I'm like, it was, it's an amazing thing to have that but in the back of your head you're like oh my god i need to be working and um yeah yeah it's, it's just how do you get through that though in your mindset of like it's actually okay not to be working um at that time i don't know if i got through <laughs> now 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 that there i see like the light at the end of the tunnel yeah. every day it's like i can get all of this done you know just knowing that there will be time because you have to schedule the time, you know? Yeah. So that's how, um, yeah, yeah. It's definitely like <laughs> you have to make it work basically. That is it yeah. literally. Like for me, it's, I have to put things in my calendar now where like we started doing it, but even more so now where it's like, okay, you will, you have to finish this, this day. And it's like in the calendar, nothing else goes in the calendar. When it's studio day, nothing else goes in the calendar. And it's like, mm -hmm. don't, don't book me in for anything else because I know it might take me a few hours to warm up just to get in there and, and get shit done. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And with the, with the album thing, it was like my agents had like put together an album tour and then I was literally like, I can get this done. Like, even though the baby's <laughs> coming and like all this and I don't have a studio and like, I have like demos and stuff and I was like, I can do this. And they're like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, like they're like all right we need to announce the tour like in two weeks what's the name of the album like i was like i i don't know like i don't have anything and it was like so crazy and they ended up rescheduling the whole tour to like this summer and yeah. then like i was like all right let me keep, let's start working and i didn't have a studio and then like my friend let me use his studio in downtown la so i was like all right Susie and my wife i was like I help me like I need to figure this out she's like just like every day just go there and do what you got to do so I would like go there for like 12 14 hours a day come home super late do it again and it was just like crazy crazy like I never worked that hard in my life and it like it felt so good to yeah. like get that deep into music again and it made me realize that like I haven't been doing anything yeah. like I thought I had been working for like the past year or so but it was all just like Bullshit. tinkering here and there yeah. compared to what I was doing at that time. Dude, Obviously yeah. I have a reason, you know, I have a commitments and, and stuff, but like, it felt like I need this in my life. Mm. Like I need to make room for this. And it was like, I would come home just feeling so accomplished and, and excited. And even though it was stressful to try to get all of this done. And, um, you know, I was like, telling her like if I did this like all the time I would be like the most successful person I mean like the most successful artist it was just like so productive and so yeah now I'm trying to like you know Switch get that in. scheduling right so I can have full days um 
to to do that kind of stuff. And I got the album done, and it came out in um June. Uh, June. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it was it was cool, and it was a just like another life learning experience. You know, it was like crazy, absolutely crazy. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Is that your that's is that your first album? It's my third album. Damn. Yeah. What was the process differently compared to all the others? Was it literally just because it was just so like you, you like deadline was so tight that you had to just get it done? Yeah. It, I wanted to do it about a year ago. I started thinking about it and I had like some demos and then we moved and then just life took over. And then like, next thing I knew they were like, Hey, we booked your tour because you told us you're going to do an album and, <laughs> and and all this stuff, and that's when it got like stressful. That was the difference was there was an actual deadline, uh, like because of the tour, yeah. And there was like promoters and and stuff like that, and support DJs and all this stuff. So it was like it was already real before I had even like done it. Yeah. Um, but I had the concept and some ideas and. It was just putting it together and the help I got from the album's called Together. Yeah. And the concept is like the idea of I've always loved strength in numbers and, and I always love being a part of a crew mm. at whatever that means or looks like at the, any given time. Yeah. And um, just like having people uh, beside you while you're pursuing your passions and kind of like trying to make your way in this crazy world and like together is just it's more fun to do together than by yourself you know what i mean i never wanted to be like some superstar or anything like that i just wanted to do cool shit with my friends and that's yeah. like my motto you know what i mean i want to do cool shit with cool people yeah. and um yeah that really came to fruition when like basically every song is a collaboration mm. and that's because of my situation and it didn't actually start out that way but all these people on the album helped me get it across the line, you know? And, um, and I also like expanded my skill set a lot, like just cause I just really dove in on, um, like mixing and, and sound design and stuff like that a bit more on this because it was cool to have the other person helping with the writing as well. Yeah. And like just getting stems back or projects back and then just really diving in and like, my friend I was working with, he's just like, there was like a couple like really skilled, like, you know, producers there that would come in and out and just be like, I'd be like, listen to this. And they'd be like, you, he had a bunch of outboard gear. So they're like, try this thing. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm running everything through this. So it was cool. And it was, you know, so it was a big team effort um, with a lot of people. And even my wife, like footing all the work at home while I was out, like yeah. finishing it. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, very different. <laughs> to be fair, I want to talk to you about the whole like doing shit together and kind of building communities and collaborations. It's something that I've noticed from the sidelines with what you've done with Nightbase from pretty much from day one from when I've been aware of who you are, which I would say is probably since 2016, I think for me, when I when I kind of was, was aware of what you'd we did, which is kind of when I first kind of came to America and started touring more so. Um, and it's something that you, you guys have done amazing as a label is like really bring a community vibe with between you and the artist and you and the fans. Like, how have you done that? Because there's I, like, there's a lot of labels that want to do that and mm -hmm. don't do it. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of labels that have it and then lose it. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of labels that just can't do that if at all. Like what was the initial, like, yeah. How the fuck did you do it? <laughs> well, going all the way back to like when I started raving and stuff, like, like I started, I don't know. I, my first like, official dj gig was probably like 98 99 and yeah. and that, so i've been like it was different back then like in america there was no it wasn't no one knew about it it was yeah. very underground yeah and um you felt like a part of this secret community and everyone was very like open and it was just like so different from what was going on in like the outside world like the mainstream mm. kind of communities and and like 
I always loved that. And that was always my favorite part about raves. And I started, like, I used to play hardcore, happy hardcore. And I started, like, a vinyl label in 2000. And it's, like, the first American, like, happy hardcore label. Sick. There was another hardcore label started by a British guy that lived in the States. Yeah. But I consider it the first. <laughs> what was it called? Because I'm American. But, like, what was yeah, that label so that called? Was like, Huh? What it was, was called Pitched Up Recordings. Sick. That's a great name. Um, probably, probably pretty embarrassing looking back if you hear it. But um, so that we had like a crew because that scene was very small. And that's where it all kind of started. Like we had like this family of people and um, I was living in Philadelphia and everyone was like in that like kind of tri-state area. Um and we did tours in a van and stuff like that. It was like really fun. So it all kind of started there and I just fell in love with that. And even before that, I was in this little crew or whatever, we do parties. And um, then I moved to New York and I was doing more like the sort of similar to what I'm doing now, you know, like housey tempo or yeah. like even like grime and stuff like tempo. Um, I was always into UK music. Clearly. So it's like hardcore, <laughs> grime, dubstep, baseline, all that stuff. And then now like kind of UK house and stuff. But yeah, so I joined this crew called Trouble and Bass um, mm -hmm. that was started by Drop the Lime and Star Eyes. And it was like, that was like, it was such a cool crew and label. And like, I was just like a fan before I joined them. Yeah. And I just became a part of that. And it was just like, this amazing crash course and like branding and, and, you know, it was like a, the modern version of community that I had kind of loved from before. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of ended that. Um, everyone went their separate ways and pursued different things. I moved to LA and um, EDM was like popping off yeah. and it was like, everyone around me was like getting rich and famous. And I just like, <laughs> wasn't really into the music that much. And I kind of, lost my way and didn't really fit in anywhere. I still had like a career, but I was just like, I don't know. You know what I mean? There was no stage at a festival for what I played or anything like that. Totally. And I was like, I went and saw um, FOMO, Gorgon City, like. Yeah, Kai. I can't remember if he was playing as Gorgon City or FOMO. I went and saw him play and it was like, you know, this kind of peak EDM time. And it was like, he was playing like UK house which I was like really into, yeah. you know, and this is 2013. And I was like, there's some people here and it's a vibe. And it's like, I was like, I need to just like do this because there's no outlet for this here. Yeah. So I was like, I'm going to start a party, not a label, just a party. And um, so January of 2014, I did the first party. But my whole goal was like, I felt like such an outsider from like what was going on around me in LA, like everyone was like, you know, it was just like big room EDM everywhere and, yeah. and dubstep and all this stuff. And I just wanted to play like UK bass house and, <laughs> and stuff like that. And there was no place for it. So I was like, all right, I'm going to like curate this night. I want to have this community of people who want this music and aren't as interested in the other music. Maybe they like both, whatever, but I wanted to build a community and did the first party and we had Christian Martin and um, from there it was really good. And then from there we did Taiki new light first time in the States next month, Chris Lorenzo first time in the States shift key first time, in the, you know, like, so I yeah. brought all these people over, like who were just like no one in America knew who they were, but to me, I really loved what they were doing. Yeah. And it just so happened that I clicked with all these people Yeah, and like, to this day, like all those original artists, like I'm still friends with, we still work together, I love that. all this stuff. So the community was like, not only like the fans, but like the artists as well. Yeah. So we all kind of came up together and um, the fans were very like um, loyal to the party and, and they trusted me yeah. with the curation because like I would bring over like someone from the UK and Chris Lorenzo and the people would be like, who the fuck is that? Yeah. Like, <laughs> why you're, you're no one's going to come like, yeah. but the fans like trusted it. You know what I mean? I could, I brought like EZ over and like, he has no like 
profile here. Not like in the UK, he's like God. a legend. God. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I brought him over and they were like, who? And then like, <laughs> but the fans, like I would say a good portion of them knew who he was because his boiler room came out by yeah. the time he got there, that big one that blew up. And then like, and he just killed it. And it was like the biggest vibe. And so I think you build this trust with like the people that come to the parties mm. to be like, he's going to show us like something good, yeah. like whatever it is, it's going to be something that is sort of cutting edge or different and, and good. And um, yeah, that's kind of like how it started. And then another thing I think that helped was I grew up listening to like, remember the tape packs? Like, yeah. Yeah. So I would like get tapes from, I would go to raves and there was this British guy that would sell tapes. Yeah. And I would like always, every time I went to a rave, I would buy a tape and they're all from like the UK and I'd have like the MC and yeah. like <laughs> the crowd of the whistles and the horns and all of that. And I was like, that always really captured me. Cause I would like just imagine myself there. And I wanted to do that with night bass. So we recorded all the nights every set and we called it tape packs and we just put them up on SoundCloud and stuff. And that got really popular. Yeah. And uh, to the point where, like, you know, you hear the crowd, too, like, in the tape, in the recording. Mm. And certain songs, they, you know how L.A. is, they look, like, yeah. and all that kind of crazy <laughs> stuff. And I would go to, like, Toronto and play one of the songs that I played on, like, one of the recordings. And the crowd would react, like, the same way, like, they had heard. Oh, really? The, yeah, yeah. Wow. Like, mimicking the recording yeah. and stuff like that. And I was, like, specifically a couple songs where I was, like, that's crazy. But that's kind of how it started. And it was like, yeah. Then it was like you build this sort of like, tr you know, this trust and bond mm. with the fans. And we always like get involved with the fans and, and stuff like that. And it's like a family, you know what I mean? And there's still people. We're about to celebrate 10 years Damn. in January. And um, there's people now who obviously, you know how it is like, clubbers ravers turn over every few years yep. they get jobs and grow up and move on but there's some people who still show up to our parties and they're like or we have like a pop-up where we sell merch during the day or something and yeah. they'll bring their kids or something you know what i mean it's like so much has happened over the past decade it's like it's wild and, and you know a lot of people and it's it's just like a really cool thing yeah really it's really cool. nice that when you see like i've made i've made amazing friends from it from like especially from like my early dirty bird days like i literally dirty bird's a similar thing where it was like before us they kind of did the same thing you know and it yeah. was like you know you were yeah. a part of that family yeah and, yeah. and mm. it's it's amazing how how it works and it's it's just like maybe it's not a lot of people's goals maybe that's not what they want to achieve um out of running a label or like running nights but for me it's just so important and like watching you guys is like a blueprint like any for, and also like longevity for me like like you guys are still doing it 10 years down and you're still creating it and you're still doing the tours and it's always really interesting and exciting and new kids can hear it and it's your i think that's the interesting thing as well is you you've kind of kept a sound going that isn't popular in the uk anymore now mm -hmm. it is obviously but it's not like what it was when you guys took it on and you mm -hmm. have turned it into something that's popular in america but also there's nobody else doing it which is wild to me in the grand scheme of things that there's still nobody else trying to do what you guys are doing because it's clearly extremely successful um what do you think that's about you mean no one in america yeah uh I think there's people doing it. I just think, I mean, at this point, you know, sound has moved on. Everyone wants to do, you know, tech, tech house. house for a while. And now <laughs> it's like kind of faster stuff. And, yeah. and, and, and I think in the UK, it's crazy because like a lot of the artists, current artists that I'm kind of like pushing along with night bass and, and getting involved with night bass, they live in the UK, but they can't play anywhere yeah. because it's you either have to play drum and bass or tech house yep. you know what i mean it or hard house really, yeah it doesn't really fit in anywhere else so uh they'll come over here and play but yeah i don't know i mean there's there's smaller labels i i think honestly like 
it's fucking hard. <laughs> like yeah. it's, it's not easy to do that. And I've had some experience going into it. And I also think that nowadays the climate's different. There's not a lot of like brands yeah. or crews. Like it's everything in the past, I would say like five years to especially now ramping up. It's like, it's a lot of individualism. Everyone yeah. wants to do their own thing. So you're like, I'm going to play my own parties. I'm going to start my own label yeah. and release my own music. So it's harder to start something like night bass because no one wants to be a part of it. You know what yeah. I mean? Like with night bass, it was like everyone, everything was lined up. It was like all these artists that I liked felt the same as me. were kind of in the same place as me. Yeah. And we all grew together. Yeah. All those artists went off and did their own thing. And night bass turned into me, um, you know, discovering newer artists yeah. and helping to build uh you know newer artists and then they go off and so that that's kind of like has been what it's become is more like an incubation for like newer artists which is cool but i think going into now now that's 10 years i'm like reflecting and looking forward at the same time and i'm like next year to celebrate the 10 years i'm bringing back like you know a lot of more established artists and focusing on the newer artists or the artists that were new yeah, that we've now been working with who are getting a little bit bigger and just keep working with them. And I think we've brought in so many unknown or like smaller on, you know, smaller artists. I want to keep developing the ones that, you know, or got got bigger you know um i think there's also on like i totally agree but i like let's be real it's still business and i think that's a clever business move at the end of the day as well is like as a, as a record label you still need to earn money it can't it's not just mm -hmm. a passion project for you is it is although it is a passion project and and you're creating something really interesting you've created an amazing community still has to be successful and in this day and mm -hmm. age where streaming is Although, yes, it's great that we make money from streaming and we're not in the, like, LimeWire days and Napster days. It's still hard for a record to be successful now, like, financially. Yeah, there's a lot of other music out there. <laughs> yeah. It's like, even if a record's great, it's it's hard to stick out, you know? Mm. Um, but, yeah, I mean... I think both ways work have worked for us um, with a newer artist. There's a lot more work that the label has to do. Yeah. Totally. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like they don't come in with a fan base. So no. you're kind of building it with them. And then, you know, like I said, nowadays, everyone's so individual that they want to go off and, and do their own thing. And I'm like, cool, go do your thing. Yeah. And, but I do want to like, that's why I kind of want to move away from that because you put a lot of work, effort and money and people don't realize that like releasing music costs money, yeah, you know, like cause you, yeah. we have people that, you know, get everything ready, create the assets and yeah. marketing and all this stuff, promo. And then um, you have to pay those people. And then by the time the song comes out, it has to make a certain amount of money to make the money back and all that stuff. So, I think focusing on people who, you know, we've worked with before and just like continuing working with them yeah. versus like keeping bringing in new people. It's like, you know, I'm old, I have kids. I want to keep working with the people I know. And um, I get excited about new artists, but it just gets more and more daunting as, as the industry evolves into yeah. a more complex and difficult thing, you know? I totally agree. And like, I guess real talk, like, how much does it cost you like for people to for people that don't know like how much does it cost you to put a, a record out roughly um it's hard to like quantify like like because of, i have a staff yeah. sort of like um i think a lot of independent labels will just like hire artist hire a person to do this hire a person to do that yeah but I have people like that work for night base who yeah. are like also the family thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're all so passionate about it and such amazing people, hard workers. And 
so it's hard to like break it up you mm-hmm. know into like release by release but yeah i mean on the cheapest side you could just do nothing and put a record out and it, you know i think probably you could probably get away with like a few hundred bucks or something but like you know if you want to do like little video assets and and if you want to do a little bit of marketing and yeah. stuff like that it costs money and it adds up really quickly and a promo campaign or something it, yeah. it all adds up um so it's, it's kind of hard to say because i don't know off the top of my head but it's um, it's hard and the bigger the artist the more money you're spending because yeah. you're like all right like this is a, a shot yeah. you know what i mean like yeah. they have a following they're tried and tested we we know this is a good song let's put some money behind it so that more people see it yeah. you know what i mean because it's hard to be get your music heard so mm-hmm. gotta spend money to get it in front of people's faces so totally. and then once they hit play they either like it or they don't and and that's where you find out because you know it's but all i think about but i think i think also with spotify and apple music and just the, the way streaming platforms are set up it's hard to even find your favorite artist music like to like even know because there's so much noise to even know that they've got a release out like you might not even hit a release radar for like yeah the first month and then you're like fuck like yeah it's so strange it's I- so true like i'll have like a release come out and i'm like it's not even on my release radar yeah. like what the f- it's me yeah like so or that's like at the bottom and i'm mm. like man this is crazy like but you know we have a good like i said like the fans trust us and i think we have a pretty good yeah there's just like certain things we have in place that work like we have a night based spotify list playlist that like when i put out a record and we put it on that playlist like and then you look at the artist section on spotify it's usually one of the top playlists. You know yeah. what I mean? It it often gets more plays than like a big playlist. Yep. So like, you know, the dedication from the small amount of fans that we have actually brings a lot of value and um, attention. So, but the, I guess the point is like reaching new fans too. So, cause you always want to, you know, to reach more people. To reach but. it. It's a, it's a tough, it's really strange at the moment. And it's a conversation that I've had plenty of times and I'm sure you have, but it's like, how does this evolve? How do you grow from this? Because it feels like it's very hard to, to have a moment if you're either like not gone viral on social media. Um, because even like big records that DJs play, like if there's one record that every DJ plays, like unless they're recording that they're playing that record and that's going up on Instagram or Spotify or Instagram or TikTok. Like you don't even know that they're playing that record. And Mm. with the way Shazam is now is it can't be Shazammed until it's released. So it's hard to build the hype up around that. And then you're like, especially if it's like a new artist, that doesn't have the following. It's like, how do you then build that? It's fucking impossible. It, it's not impossible because it clearly happens, but like it's yeah. very different nowadays. And there's a lot of mystery too. Yeah. Like sometimes things will take off and we're like, how yeah. did this happen? And you can kind of like trace it back. Sometimes you'll find a source of like where it's coming from. But, you know, sometimes it's a little bit of a mystery. Like I did a record with this artist from Detroit called Clank. Yeah. Um, and he's been on the label for years and years and he's a sick producer and um we did a record with queen mills from the uk she's amazing like rapper singer artist and we did a record and it's just like never quit like it started like pretty good but like it's probably like four years old maybe and like it's like i think it just hit 10 million and it's like we haven't done anything extra like (laughs) marketing or it just like there's certain records that like just go and never stop you know and then sometimes there's a record that would do really big on beatport but then like nothing on spotify and then vice versa you know it's 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 interesting it's really strange that and how there's no correlation i we i talk about this all the time with my team is like you might have a record that does really well on radio but then doesn't do anything on spotify or even beatport 
And it, it's just, mm -hmm. it's weird that there's no correlation because they used to be like back before streaming, it was like, if you did a rec, if your record was doing well on Beatport, it would do well on specialist radio in the UK and the DJs were playing it and it meant that you were doing well. You can have a Beatport number one now and it not stream, <laughs> which is mm. fucking crazy. It's, yeah. it's very weird. It's really weird. Also, I don't think it even translates to like gigs either. No. You know? Um, you could put, there's artists that don't put music out forever and then just have a crazy busy schedule with sold out shows and, and crazy fans. And, you know, it's also disconnected and there's, it's hard to figure it out. And I think a lot of people drive themselves crazy trying to find like a pattern or a formula. Yeah. And it's like, everyone's different. Every artist is different, you know, and, and the way it takes off, you might be big over here, but not here. And yeah. it, that's why I think, you know, years ago when people used to look at numbers, they'd look at your followers and your likes and your streams. And it was like, that's how they quantified like your worth or yeah. whatever, you know, putting a value on who you are as an artist. And I think that's so just not a real thing. Yeah, it doesn't like those numbers don't translate to like real life because there's other things like just how much people I don't know how dedicated your fans are or mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, well, yeah, yeah it's um, like classic example. Like I'm, a, I, I'm only using myself for example, right? Like I go on my Spotify now and I go, where are people listening? Okay. So my biggest listeners are Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Brussels, Berlin, London. They're my top five. Okay. I play in Berlin. I don't play in Amsterdam unless it's ADE. I've never played in Rotterdam. I've never played in Russell's. I play in Berlin quite a lot and I haven't played in London for two years. And it just goes to show, right? Like yeah. how, what you're seeing on data doesn't correlate with what you're doing. Like my biggest touring is North America. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because you almost want to like, let me go play a show in those cities and, mm. and just see what happens. Because obviously there's someone there listening to your music, but maybe the promoters aren't aware of you. But who knows? Like I said, you just don't know. No. Like, And you know it, how it is. Try. You know how it is, though, because it's like, <laughs> like the, some of this, like we could go to multiple promoters in Amsterdam or Rotterdam or wherever and go, please book Will Clark, here's some data. But it's like, well, yeah. actually, no, like all these promoters are only promoting tech house nights or hard house nights or something like that. And there's nobody in that market doing what you did in America where it was like, there's a market for something like this. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's very, it's a very strange industry. It's like, I, I can't remember who I was talking to um, the other day and they were talking to this like athlete he he was like a i think he was like an american olympic athlete swimmer um and after after being an athlete he went into like kind of business management and business talking and kind of like would be a consultant in business and like structuring businesses because being an athlete you're very like dedicated you have to be very structured on on those things and they were um explaining this this person my friend was explaining the music industry and was saying like you can put a record out and it can do this and it can do that but then it doesn't correlate into anything else it can literally just do its own thing and like how you can you can say you could put like 10 records out and none of them do well and then the 11th record does really well and he was like this guy was just absolutely amazed. He was like, that's not an industry. That's fucking gambling. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so true, but you have to do it to like, there's just something in the back of your head where you're like, yeah, but what if this record does really well and it blows up and it gets you to where you're at? And there's always that what if in the back of my mind is like, what if I don't put that out? What if I did put that out? And like, do you, do you get the same thing? Um, 
I was thinking about this yesterday. It's like, if I put a record out and it doesn't do anything, it doesn't like bother me at all. Like, really? As long as I like the record, like I look back in, in the catalog, I would say like probably four out of five. I'm like, Oh, that's like not that good. But like at the <laughs> time it served a purpose for me. And like, yeah. I don't know, you've got to be an artist. And if you have a, you make the decision to put something out, it's like, you're doing it for a personal reason. And I think, I don't know. I think that's a good reason to do things is like if you're an artist making you're creating something, hoping that other people will like it. Yeah. You should make it for yourself, not other people. And I don't I don't know. I don't really know. Like I, I don't really care that much. Like obviously I want my every song to go go off, but yeah. like it doesn't and it doesn't bother me. And and you know, some people like it, that makes me happy. You know, and have you always been like that? I think so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's like times where I'm like, I want a hit song. Yeah. I've never had like a hit song. I've had like songs that are like, I have a good catalog of music that like does well. Yeah. But like, I've never had like a song that was like, <laughs> same. Boom. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, and yeah. Um, maybe close, but or on like an underground level, but yeah. no, nothing like, you know, remotely big, but I don't really care. Like it, I still have a career. I think it would be nice to have that, but I think it would also add a lot of pressure. Mm. Um, Cause I know people who, who have hit songs and there's always that pressure to do the follow up that sounds, you know, same. make another yeah, one, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, I've, which I've, is a good problem. Oh, totally. You know? And I was talking about this earlier on with somebody else on the podcast. And for me, like I'm glad I haven't had a hit record at this point in my career. Like I'm really actually happy and purely with my theory is, is that I've built a foundation of followers and fans that buy tickets and that listen to my music purely based on not having a hit record. And for me, mm -hmm. that's more valuable because I think it's, especially nowadays is it's not easy, but there's so many more people having hit records for a month for two months and that record does huge things but there isn't a foundation of like ticket buyers followers like constant listeners and it's mm. for me it's like i don't know if you feel the same but from an outsider's point of view like your career is also very much like that you've built this amazing crew and community around you and you've built this amazing business based on consistency mm. Yeah, it's like trust or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I, I think like what makes me really happy about my career, one thing I'm like most like satisfied with with my career is like when I DJ, like if I play like the big stage at a festival and it's like 75% unreleased music yeah, and uh, the rest 25 that is released is like, mine or my friends or like nothing like that's like a gigantic hit or whatever and the crowd is like fully fucking behind it and it's packed the whole time and it's like unreleased music by some unknown artist is like going off it's like to me that just feels so good like i'm not playing like levels edit or whatever you know what i yep. mean like it's and that might not mean shit to anybody else, but like, to me, it just feels good to be able to like feed that stuff to like people who want it and, and watch them enjoy it. I it think, just feels good. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, Cause I love discovering new music and I love sharing it through that way. You know, I think it's also uh, about being super authentic to who you are. And mm -hmm. if I think it's very easy to go on stage and just play every edit and every banger in the world and all the everyone absolutely lose it, right? Which is great. Like there's purposes for that and there's times that that has to happen. But like when that's who you are as a person, which is who you are and it still works and fans still turn up to come and watch you play, like there's nothing more, there's nothing better about that at all. Yeah, it's, it's a buzz. Yeah. It's a buzz. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, this, I think it was Friday, just gone or Saturday. You just did shrine with, with Loz. How, yeah. How was that? It was really sick. So we kind of, obviously we've been friends, like I said, since like the third night base, I think. And so going on 10 years and 
we've done a lot of music together. Um, and we decided last year, a couple years ago, like, let's start a just a cool, let's just like label our collaboration project. Yeah. Um, we had a record called Fly With Us um, that was like, we basically had it like unreleased for like a couple years and everyone was always asking for it. Um, so it was kind of like this joke, like we're never going to put it out. But then we eventually put it out and then we decided to just call our project Fly With Us. Yeah. And um, so we've done a few sets and like this year we started planning out. We wanted to kind of take it. We kind of really wanted to go all in on this thing. So, you know, it's like my best friend. We love working together. We work really well together. Um, we have fun when we DJ together. Um, it's all just the same, same old story, right? It's like doing cool shit with cool people and yeah. like having fun. Mm. And, you know, we wanted to take it to like another level and not just like two guys showing up and DJing. So we started working on like a stage production yeah. that we want to bring to our shows and we want to play, you know, we want to pick and choose which shows to play. Yeah. And the first sort of uh unveiling of the production was at shrine so we've been like working on this thing for six months you know designing the the stage um doing the content the lighting all this stuff and we've both of us have never done anything like that before and it's like it's it's a lot of work it's expensive and you know but it was like we really wanted to do this and we really want to like invest in ourselves and and try to do something really cool and big yeah. and so that was sort of like the first time we saw it in person or anyone saw it in person and um it was awesome it was really cool and i think you know everyone loved it it was cool it sold out and all that and it was like just a good fun vibe and it looked great and now that people have seen it you know, we can be like, cause we've been like trying to tell promoters about it and they're like, Oh, I don't really understand. Cause you show them like drawings of it and of stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. But now we have videos and, and stuff like that. So you can just be like, here it is. And they'll be like, I want it or I don't want it. So I think that's the next step. That was a big step for us was designing that, executing it yeah, and just showing the world. And then, um, it was a success and now it's like, let's take that somewhere else. And we built it in a way that you could just go anywhere and kind of source, you know, the, the parts and, and build it. And, um, yeah, it's cool. And it's, it's not a live show, but it's a DJ set, but you know, it's very, every set's different. We've been writing a new intro song for every set we do. Yeah. Um, there's a lot that goes into it and we're very, very serious about it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. It's like both of us are kind of leaning into it. Um, where else are you planning on doing it? Her solo. Hmm? Where else are you planning on doing it? Uh, nothing yet. That was like, that was, that was the big thing that we yeah. had to like get out of the way. Yeah. And now it's like, all right, let's see what happens. So yeah. Sh selling that many tickets. How many tickets is Shrine? Like five? Yeah. Five. Is that the biggest show you've done in LA? yes yeah how does that feel good we did it last year as well yeah um but but not as this, this year, right this is different the pressure behind it was different yeah. i think um and this year there's just so much more events going on yeah you know every day it was like another announcement and we were like oh my god <laughs> just closure the same night oh my god <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, it's, you know, that's, that's how it goes, but, um, it worked out and yeah, it feels good. It's, there's a lot of pressure these days on like, you got to sell out a bunch of tickets and it's like, can we just have a good show? When did, <laughs> you that, know? Yeah, when did that culture start? Because I, for me, it was just after COVID more so like, I know like leading into COVID for me, it was still about selling as many tickets as possible, but it feels like after COVID, everything has to be sold out. Otherwise you failed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've been talking about that with some people lately. It's like, it's interesting because it's obviously like, if you don't sell out, everyone's still, and it's a good night. Everyone's still making money and it's a success, but like there's something, it's like we live in this world of like instant gratification and like, you know, 
just being able to say sold out it's yeah. like easy right and it's like you won or whatever mm. not like it was a good show and a lot of people were there it's like easier to just be like sold out and that everyone understands it and yeah i don't know it's weird I what's your thoughts on people telling putting things on their social media that it's sold out because it feels like more of an ego I, thing rather than uh actual letting people know tickets are gone uh i'm fine with it i think it's like you have to if you you know it's like if you want to be a musician or a dj or whatever this day and age there's a lot of things you have to do to to make it there's yeah. a lot of games and facets of your career that people didn't have to do before as the artist yeah and i think something like that is one of them and and almost feels weird if you wouldn't do that you know what i, you know I, what I, I mean? really struggle with it <laughs> yeah i know yeah. yeah i really struggle with that whole like i i get it with like merch and things like that but i think mm. for me that i struggle with the whole like thanks for an amazing sellout weekend people like i just mm. feel like there's it's not it is about that of course it is it's a business right but there for me there's like do the fans care that it's sold out like mm. what what are we doing this for like in the grand scheme of things yes we're doing it to to earn money now but like the people that actually follow us do they care that it's sold out mm. i don't know i would guess a percent a percentage cares but they support you especially people your um fans that like followed you for a long time yeah i see that in the comments they'll be like because after the shrine i was like sold out you know thanks for the sold out you know exactly yeah, what yeah, you're yeah, talking yeah, about yeah. it was like you know there's fans that are like oh you guys deserve it and that kind of stuff and it's like that's nice. some people do care some people probably don't even fucking notice and yeah i don't know why you know i think like also for the industry it's more of like a and telling the rest of you know the yeah. promoters or whatever you yeah, know it's, it's a weird it's you gotta a weird advertise thing. yourself you you gotta promote yourself you know yeah and a lot of this shit is smoke and mirrors well this is the thing it's like how many people don't sell out but say sell out Ooh, that's a big move that's a bold move is <laughs> i bet it happens i bet it happens i bet it happens i bet it happens I, we can gar I, I can guarantee you there's multiple people that that will say it's sold out and it doesn't sell oh out. my god i don't know about that i wouldn't do that but i couldn't do that smoke and mirrors but hey it works i right? remember i just thought of this like when twitter first came out like before people really knew what to do with it it, it wasn't really used for like what it is now like people Not have discussions on there and stuff yeah, like yeah. that but like back in the day it'd be like i'm drinking a coffee literally you know what yeah, I mean? yeah. Like, <laughs> in the third person it was like will clark yeah. is currently eating a burger but i remember when it was like yeah i remember when it was like a, a sort of etiquette started to appear so i remember djs would be like literally just be like i killed it last night <laughs> like they would say stuff like that and that started to be like that's kind of weird and then people would call other DJs like that became like a thing that was like don't say that yeah but then then it was like you had to like slyly say you killed it yeah. without saying you killed it just like show a picture or yeah. like you know what i mean retweet someone but now it's like we've kind of gone back to being like i killed it last i sold out last night like <laughs> yeah it's just it's gone back it's gone back to yeah. just like stroking your own ego so much but it yeah it's strange how do you how do you how do you manage with your ego as a <laughs> successful artist who do you think you are yeah um no and I, I mean that genuinely like because everyone has an ego at some point right we all have a, an ego whether it's a negative or positive, but like, how, how do you kind of stay grounded? Cause like, I've seen you, I've met you over the years. Like you, you're just the normal dude plays. Don't stroke my ego, bro. Don't stroke my ego. <laughs> no, um, yeah. Like, I don't know. I think it goes back to like what I said earlier. I'm just like terrified that all of this is like going to go away. Yeah. I don't know why I, that's just how I feel. And yeah. I always, I'm a pretty like, I mean, I feel pretty positive about myself and, and, you know, and what I do, 
but there's also like a lot of doubt you know what i mean mm. like there's so many external things and it's it's tough but i think one good piece of advice that someone gave me was like especially earlier on like leading into night base was like don't worry about what other people are doing yeah like and i think that affects your ego a lot like why does this person have that and i don't and yeah. you know what i mean and it's like a terrible thing to think about and and uh, just like not good so i just years ago just stopped like thinking about like if i see someone being successful it's like great that's awesome yeah. i gotta keep working too you yeah. know what i mean and people achieve things because they did something to achieve that totally. they didn't get lucky even though it seems like people get lucky not really they no. did work yeah. and and you know i think like once i realized like it doesn't work like that i just you just grind it out you know yeah. what i mean and and then you do all these other things like going on social media and, and you have to do that stuff and and um but yeah i don't know the ego thing I don't even think about it. I don't even I have no idea how to answer that. It's I a think tough I kinda one. Kind of did. No, you did. But, you did massively. Yeah. I think the whole comparison of other people and looking at other people's can really get you. And it, for, I'll be honest, it still gets me sometimes. Like I'll catch myself, yeah. like, and what the fuck? And then, like, I'll stop myself and be like, no, you're just you. There's space for everybody, right? And 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 there is room for everyone to be successful. And the fact that somebody's became more successful than you, quicker than you, it's cool. They might be unhappy. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like, it's it's not a competition for me anymore. It was for, for a long period at the beginning of my career. It was definitely a competition. Um, mm -hmm. Now it's definitely not. It's changed massively. Because I realized like no, nothing that anyone else is doing is gonna like affect you no. uh, unless they're like attacking you or something yeah, but like yeah. it's it's like i don't know there's no threat you know what i mean yeah um but i also find that it's i don't know i just really enjoy like seeing other people who people who come from like the same sort of like passion that like i feel like i have like yeah. i see them doing something that's difficult and they get success i'm like that's fucking cool like yeah. that makes me like feel really good mm. and like i don't know nothing i don't know none of that shit bothers me it's it great used to. yeah yeah i think i think it, it take, there comes a time right and i think for me as well there's like some days when i'm like a bit down in the dumps in like personal life or like something else is going on in my life and then i look at something else and i'm like it i can get into that mindset occasionally but like I remember like 2018 for me, it was just like a year of just like doubting everything and looking at everybody else. And it's just debilitating in like a career when you're trying to create interesting stuff because you just try and it just doesn't work. <laughs> it's just impossible. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. And it's almost like, I guess that's almost like a, a litmus test for how you feel about yourself. Yeah. Right. It's like, because you kind of are in a rut or you feel bad that happens to everybody. And it's like, suddenly you see everyone else up and also all the, everything you see, it could be like real or fake. You know exactly. what I mean? We're just yeah, looking yeah. on social media. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, everything looks like great and wonderful. And, but if you feel bad about something or you're depressed or whatever, it's like, yeah, I think you would have a negative you know what I mean? It's almost like I agree. I'm mad at them because I feel bad. Yeah. Um, I, I can see that about myself. And it's actually got that. nothing to do with them. It's yeah. It's just yeah. it's kind of a projection as a as a person is like projecting your feelings onto onto that situation and kind of blaming that situation why rather than being very internal and looking at yourself and look and working yeah. through the through the issues yourself. And lately I've I've kind of like felt a bit of I think we all noticed sort of a change in like sounds out there yeah. in the clubs and, and stuff like that. And I feel that. And I feel like night bass when, when I started night bass, it was not there. And then that sound grew and then kind of flooded America. Um, and then now it kind of went out for a while 
other stuff came in, but now there's other stuff coming in on top of that stuff. Yeah. So it's like you feel it coming around you. So yeah. it's like the world is changing or the the world of music that our little world of music is like changing a bit. That's and cool. um it's scary. But all I do is just think like, all right, I gotta just fucking work harder. And yeah. and my advice to people was always like, just stick to your sound and do your sound and don't chase what's popular. And um, I have to sometimes tell myself that, you know what I mean? Like, cause you feel a bit left behind sometimes. 100%. And it's like, 100%. but I just like, all right, let me just, I love this music that I make. I love, it's just always a slow evolution. I like to like, you know, change and it just kind of reignite the passion and yeah. find some new sounds or whatever. And um, yeah, it's, it's, the mental health thing in, in music is a real, you know, there's a reason why everyone talks about it. It's, it's one day you're on, you know, you're doing really well. And the next people are like, who? Yeah. You know, so. It's weird. It's, gotta... it's also weird how the industry doesn't think of that in a grand scheme of things because it is a business and businesses don't think about emotions. There's no, there's no emotion in business generally. Like if you go sit in a board meeting of like a fortune 500, the likelihood that they're thinking of someone's feelings that it's not is they're thinking about how do we make as much money as possible it's exactly what promoters do it's exactly what agents do it's exactly what managed managers do and it's exactly what record labels do like it's just mm -hmm. and i don't mean that in a horrible way i'm not saying that's a negative thing because it it is what it is the real artist in the music industry is the artist and i was talking to somebody i'm in the process of doing like a deal at the moment and there's this like battle when you mix business and art and the like the emotions that can come up with it because the business side of it doesn't care about the emotions and doesn't care about what you put into it and how long you've been put into it like even when like there's A and R's involved, even when there's people that like you've put so much work into something and then it's literally just like not what they want or like the the amount of rejection you deal with as, as an artist as well is it does it's it's definitely it's hard. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy process. Yeah, music is like it's a mix of it's like a fun thing, right? Yeah. But then it's mixed with business and then there's like relationships and then a lot of people who don't who only know the business part who come and go and yeah. i think like being in the dance music industry in a in in some kind of way for the past 20 plus years is like like those relationships that i've built by just being a good person yeah. and like making friends with other people because we work in this because we love music. Yeah. Um, a lot of those people that I've known from a long time ago are still there yeah. in some way or another. And like people have, you know, there's a lot of dickheads that come in and they come and go. Yeah. And you know, when someone comes in and, and stirs things up, those, all those people that have been around forever, you're just like, yeah, yeah. And you know, you kind of like, you see you're it. each other's like rock you know yeah. what i mean and it's a brutal it could be like a brutal industry and i think some people it definitely takes like a thick skin sometimes but i think it's okay to talk about all that yeah i think it's, i think it's important about. to talk about it because i think yeah. there's there's artists that are listening to this that are coming up that are getting rejected and they're going through the shit that that we all go to go through and they're just like why me and it's just kind of a mm -hmm. realization that it's not just you, it's fucking everybody. In this industry, no matter how big or how small, it's like there's always somebody yeah. kind of, yeah. I, I just, I think what reiterating what you said as well, it's like, for me, it feels like it's been more so like that in the last like year or two, even mm -hmm. more, more so than what it ever has been. Not too sure why. Maybe it's, mm -hmm. maybe we're going through that EDM stage, what that happened in during that edm period where like so much money has come into the industry that people want to want to get involved and make more money from it yeah i think there's something there 
it definitely feels like there's an influx of new people, which is good. But then you get, you know, a Shit. lot of people that don't know like the history or all that that kind of important stuff. Yeah, the and culture. how to sort of treat people and yeah. and all that. But it's funny because, you know, I remember when I was younger, when I was like 20, I went to like the UK and I was working with some of like like my heroes yeah. and like hardcore who like, you know, I would just like go and work, you know, sit in a studio with, you know, someone and like, it was a different time, right? Where like, you kind of had to pay your dues yeah. heavily. And, and I was like, I really wanted to get better at producing. And I remember being in the studio with this guy and he was like, we were working on something and I'm like, Oh, like, why don't you try this or that? And like, He's like, yeah, go make us a cup of tea. You know what I mean? Like, I, but I was like a kid and I was like, I want to learn. So I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll go make yeah, some tea, yeah, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. um, yeah. but I think it's a bit different now because you don't have like, there's not much of a barrier. Like right. you could learn how to produce on YouTube. You could like download samples and make a hit song quickly. And, but it, then navigating the industry after that's very tough because you didn't have to go through that yeah sort of gatekeeping that weeds out if you're basically you have to figure out if this is something you want to deal with or yeah. not you know what i mean yeah, and yeah, totally so uh, i am still here if my camera just is playing up at the moment disappeared yeah um no i totally agree because i think um also you can pay somebody to make your record for you that's true yeah <laughs> yeah which is a weird situation now where you're seeing like like a lot of house records being written by other people which i have no issue with but i think it also takes that level of like hustle out of it to a certain extent because they've became popular on on social media and they've got a demand but they still don't have the product which is fucking wild to me that that's happening mm -hmm. on, a, on a regular basis but, I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, that's fine. <laughs> I think that's cool. Whatever. But it's not me. I just don't understand. Same. You know. I guess. I guess I understand. You're like, I want to be famous and like standing on the stage like this. You know. It's cool. <laughs> yeah, I I get it. I get it. I think this is the amazing thing about what it actually benefits us, because yes, the more people that come to the scene, the more likelihood they're going to listen to our music. And, and get involved or we're going to be booked at festivals and they're going to be there and they we, we get new fans it's fucking amazing that and, and for me i'm like all for the more people that get bigger in the scene the better it is for, for all of us um yeah it's definitely definitely interesting yeah like you said i feel like there is like a big influx of of new people which yeah. is awesome yeah um because if you've been in the scene for a long time, new people are like, they'll find out about you and come to you. Like that happens to me all the time. Like kids will come and be like, like young kids and they'll be like, kind of like have like blowing up or whatever. And just be like, oh, you know, I heard your music when I was a little kid or yeah. like my brother listened to it. And you're just like, makes you feel old, but it's like cool that like, they're interested in, in that sort of like the people that have been around you know yeah. not just the new hot yeah it's thing. cool <laughs> super cool man um yeah. what's your plan for the rest of the year the rest of the year just make tunes um got some new ones with lorenzo uh, probably one new one with lorenzo coming out this year um just planning this night base 10 year yeah. basically we'll be celebrating all year um we'll be doing 10 shows like a tour Amazing. next year um big ones yeah just Huh? Big ones or just small? Instruments? Yes, pretty big. Not like huge. There's a couple bigger ones, but yeah, it'll it'll be it'll be special. So bringing cool. out, trying to pull out some good guests for those. That's that's the tough part. But so um, hard in it. Yeah, yeah, getting people yeah. to play your events because they all want to play their own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, man. Um, just. So, all right, so this is like the studio I'm using. I've been using for a while, like four months. I'm building a studio Sick. in my backyard Amazing. that's almost done. So that's like my biggest thing for this year is like when that's done in a few weeks, like I will be setting everything up and just 
grinding out as much music as possible so it's been tough like i said like for the past year i haven't had a studio yeah, really that's rough. um so yeah so it would be excited to to have a place where i can bring people to work with and yeah if you come to la maybe come through and check it out Man, i'd love to i'd absolutely love yeah. to i'd love to grab some food and like actually catch up because we never get the chance to do that so I'd yeah be, man I'd it's be been a long that. time yeah it'd be great to do that get Loz out where, there as well where are you now i'm in the uk right now oh, okay in the uk um i just got back from america uh on monday i Mon know uh, tuesday yesterday where um, do you stay mostly depends well i just i was living in detroit a lot of the time um so i do like 50 50 america 50 50 detroit 50 50 like bristol somerset area um, but I've just sold my house in Detroit, so I'm, I will be going back to Michigan, but not for a while. So I'm just kind of like chilling in the UK and being a bit of a nomad and like testing out some new cities and just working it out as and when really. Um, Mr. Worldwide. It's going to be weird to be fair. Cause again, I won't have a studio in America. So like my only studio time is in England. Mm. Um, what are some cities that you're looking at? I'm going to go, I've got some friends in Austin, pretty much just anywhere where I've got friends that I, so I don't have to pay for hotels <laughs> or like yeah. Airbnb. So I've got some friends in Austin, which I might spend a bit of time there. Um, I'm probably going to come to LA just to get some work done. Cause I always find it really productive. Just working there. I personally wouldn't want to live there again. But like, it's very easy to get work done. Um, I don't really know where else. Any yeah. recommendations? Oh man, <laughs> I like LA, but the only place, I guess the only place I'd probably live outside of LA at this point in my life, man, I don't know. It's tough, isn't I it? I really like London. You know, I've always loved London. Yeah. Um, but I'm a city. I like cities, but I do. I think LA is my spot. Yeah. How long you but been there? You know there? how it is. Like the city's only as good as the people you're around, right? One hundred percent. That's a good move going to where you have friends because you could be in the best city in the world, but if you don't have any good friends or any good people around, it's kind of like it's kind of pointless. What am I doing here? Yeah. <laughs> you no, know? I agree. I agree. I think that was also the issue when I lived in LA initially. I think I moved there like 2015 for like a few months and I didn't really know anyone at all. Like I didn't know, have any real friends there at that time. It was like, just as my career had just started in like touring, um, in, in America at least. And yeah, it was just like, not lonely, but like very disjointed. It's a daunting place. Yeah. There's like a lot of pressure to like do, I don't know. There's just like so much stuff going on yeah. and, you know, it's like Hollywood and, and all that shit and music, all the music that's here. It's like, yeah, it's yeah, it's, a lot. it's daunting, I think, when you first come here. But yeah, yeah I know I, I just we, we all know so many people that love it as well, which is weird. Like mm -hmm. I still struck like my manager lives there and I still I'm like, dude, why do you guys live here? Like I don't I still can't <laughs> get it, but people love it. So I'm clearly wrong. I'm the one that's wrong. No, it's just not for you. Yeah, true. that. Yeah, I, I moved from New York. And I was going to come here for a year. Mm. And I was like, I just need a break from New York. Like, yeah. let me go to L.A. for a year. And I just, and I was always like, there's always like that New York, L.A. beef back in the day. And yeah. I was like, L.A. sucks. And then <laughs> I like fell in love with it. And then now it's been like 11 or 12 years since then. So See, New York's my jam. I love New York. If, yeah. if, I, if I was rich as fuck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I would be in New York all the time. Yeah. Or like 50% of the time because I like countryside. I'm like a bit of a country boy. So like I'd ideally like place in the country in the UK, like New York, Brooklyn townhouse in Williamsburg. I'm yeah. all over that. But you, you just need to make like two mil a year. And then pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ma maybe more uh, everyone... nowadays. Everyone I knew in New York is like gone. I maybe know like a few people left there because it's just like crazy expensive. And I, I think now with kids, I, I could never live in New York just logistically. No. Like moving around with two babies is like Not insane. There. And also but, like, I think the quality of life 
generally in New York is like more like younger person like hustling trying to like get in yeah. it, in at life whereas like when you want to like chill a little bit it's like there's nowhere to fucking chill in new york like even if you're in central park it's not chill at all mm. it's like it's pretty non-stop um but yeah it's such a great city i i always um in new york it was a great time when i lived there it was like that like blog house era yeah and it was just such a good crew of people like because we had trouble in base and then there was like fool's gold and all these other yeah. crews and we all were like friends and would like support each other and it was like this great thing but the one thing that i always liked about la is when i would come out here everyone's so open about like you know oh just come to the studio and like we'll do this or like i do this like we should do something together yeah. everyone's very like open and collaborative whereas in new york it was very like Clicky. protective yeah like I like you're like I have a studio, but like I'm using it. You know what I mean? There's no like it's not like come through. It's like very like I have stuff to do. And I think it's almost like something that comes from like the lack of space. Yeah. Where you're just very like I wanna share. this is my space. But like out here it was always I was always like, Man, this is crazy. Like everyone just wants to like hang out and work together and like listen to each other's music and I just fell in love with that lifestyle yeah. versus being very isolated, even though you're hanging out with these people and you know what they're doing. It wasn't the same. You know what I mean? It's, it's, totally. it's a little bit different. No, I totally get no it. Spaces to hang out. Like it's like you go to a restaurant or a bar yeah. or like, you know what I mean? There's not like spots like here. Um, no, I agree, man. I yeah. totally agree with that. Dude, we've just done nearly an yeah. hour and a half. We should probably wrap this up. Cool. Um, thank you so much for coming on. I've really enjoyed this one. Um, I usually end it with how can people follow you and get involved with what you do, but pretty much everybody knows what you do and they probably listen to this. But however, <laughs> how how do you get involved with the night based scene? How do you how do you follow? Who do you follow? What do you listen to? Blah blah blah. Uh, at DJ AC Slater on social media. Um, at nightbase and uh, nightbase.info watch out for uh nightbase 10 year anniversary we're coming it's um thinking. it's going to be a great year of sort of rebirth of the label and everything so watch out for that Sick. and fly with us me and lorenzo go see we'll a party <laughs> dear promoters go and book a show <laughs> yeah mate thank but you dude, so thank you so much for having me man oh, mate, finally anytime. finally yeah i know we do like i need to let's let's do this more often man like i'd love to catch up with you in person so let's let's, let's plan it when when i'm in la absolutely man cool man keep safe see you soon all right see you soon peace, man peace man thank peace. you thank you and that's a wrap big love to you, ac for coming on uh, big love to everybody. Listen, please subscribe, go join the Discord and keep safe and I'll see you next time.